Conditions again tomorrow and through midweek with highs near 80 in the L.A. Basin. Into the mid to upper 80s in the valleys. Right now it's 67 in Chatsworth, 65 in Anaheim, and 65 at the L.A. Civic Center. I'm Rob Marinko, 790 KABC. Filling in for Doug McIntyre tonight, and I'll be here till 12 midnight. We'll take calls on everything and anything you want to discuss. It's open forum. Now, the way, if you've never heard my show before, if you've never heard the way I do this, the way we do it is uh, I give you the phone number, which is 1 800 222 KABC, toll free. You call, bring up whatever you want to talk about, and I try to talk about it with you. Uh, my specialty is having no specialty. And uh, with all these uh, many any varied experiences and the varied background that I have, I talk about most things uh, with a reasonable degree of intelligence. So I hope you'll be calling me and putting up whatever it is that's on your mind. News story, uh, politics, uh, oh, movies, books, plays, uh, music, uh, as long as it's the right kind of music. Uh, anything you want to talk about, we'll talk about. Our crew tonight, Wayman at the controls, Rob with the news and traffic, and Louie uh, is the screener. And uh, I'm Ira Fistel, as I said, and Doug McIntyre worked earlier today, so I get to do his regular show, the 9 to 12. My regular time is 9 to 12 on Saturday and Sunday evenings, uh, in case you, again, did not know my regular schedule, but I'm on regularly Saturday and Sunday evenings. I have a list of upcoming programs that you might be interested in. I'll tell you some of the things that, that we're going to be doing on the weekends and on some weekday shows that I will be doing in the future. Next Saturday night is the anniversary of the death of Marilyn Monroe. Uh, she died on the night of the 4th to 5th of August, uh, what was it, 1962, which is almost 40 years ago, I guess, 39 years ago. Can you imagine Marilyn Monroe would be 75 if she was still alive? <laughs> Can you imagine a 75-year-old Marilyn Monroe? Anyway, uh, so on Saturday night, Kenny Kingston's going to be with us. Now, you've probably heard Kenny Kingston before, uh, somewhere on the air. He's delightful, he's interesting, he's lots of fun, and he has a lot to say about uh, the story of Marilyn Monroe. So, Kenny will be with us next Saturday night. Now, next Sunday night, August 5th, we're going to discuss the most famous unsolved murder case in all of American history. You know what I'm talking about? Lizzie Borden took an axe and gave her mother 40 wax, and when she saw what she had done, she gave her father 41. The Lizzie Borden case, the anniversary of it, is this weekend. And so on August 5th, Professor William Masterton, University of Connecticut, retired, uh, who is an expert on the Lizzie Borden case and has written a book about the Lizzie Borden case. And uh, I've talked to him before. He's very interesting. And the Lizzie Borden case, of course, is absolutely fascinating. It's been a uh, hundred and some odd years now. Uh, nobody is for sure certain of what happened yet. And we probably never will be. Did Lizzie take the axe? and kill her mother, stepmother and father? Or was it somebody else? And if it was somebody else, who the heck else? That's always been the big question with the Lizzie Borden case. Who else? So anyway, we're going to talk about Lizzie and uh, what a delightfully fascinating case it is. You know what they did with the house in Fall River? The, the house is still standing where the Borden murders occurred. My understanding is, I haven't seen this, but my understanding is it's now a bed and breakfast. You can stay in it. <laughs> How would you like to stay in the room where Mrs. Borden was murdered, you know? Not for you, oh, women. <laughs> Not for you. All right, that's Sunday, August 5th, a week from Sunday night. On Friday, August 10th, I guess we Pat Morrison of the L.A. Times, and she's uh, written a new book uh, about the Los Angeles River, basically. Interesting subject. And we'll talk with Pat on the, 5th, uh, the 10th of, Jan of August. I'm sorry, what am I saying, January, August? And on Saturday, August 11th, Frank Lloyd Wright makes a uh, appearance from the beyond. Uh, this is one of the things that we do on this show frequently. I like to invite uh, people who have not been with us for a long time to return and appear as guests on my program. And so Frank Lloyd Wright will be here on the 11th of August, which is a Saturday night, the world's greatest architect. And if you don't believe it, just ask him. <laughs> He'll tell you he was the world's greatest architect. Okay, those are shows coming up. And uh, now... Let's talk about the phones. The telephone number is 1-800-222-KABC, 1-800-222-5222, toll free. Now, I don't have a computer screen going here 
I don't know why, but neither one of these screens is working. Let's see, maybe this one's not working because it's shut off. That would be a good reason for it not to be working. But anyway, uh, I don't know who's on the line next, but I will, and maybe I'll know in a minute here. Okay. Uh, is it Garrett? Is that our first caller? Okay. Garrett is it. Hi, Garrett. You're on the air on KABC. How you doing, Ira? Good. Uh, I just saw the uh, movie Planet of the Apes last night. Oh, yeah. Apparently, a lot of people are going to see that. I, I Actually, I really enjoyed it. I didn't have very high hopes, but I did enjoy it, and it actually got me to thinking. Um, is it possible for different species of monkeys and apes to breed? Because wouldn't their chromosomes be somewhat the same? Just the same way that humans are, we can all breed amongst ourselves? Are yeah, they but uh, they're different species. We're all one species. Well, but amongst monkeys, are there any different types of monkeys that could crossbreed and perhaps start a whole different race of monkeys? Because it's actually something within the movie. And uh, Yeah, I don't think that can happen. No, chromosomally not correct. I don't think it can happen. I don't think they're uh, they're close enough. I might be wrong on something, but I'm pretty sure that uh, most ape and monkey species uh, cannot mate with other ape and monkey species. So, so it's not like with humans where we have different appearances and different... Well, but we're not different species. We're all the human... There's only one race, the human race. There's no such thing as a race other than the human race. But wouldn't simian be a species? No. No, the no. species is orangutan, gorilla, uh, chimpanzee... Oh, I uh, see. You know, a rhesus monkey, you know. By the way, monkeys are also very different from apes. Oh, I, I wasn't aware of that. Oh, yeah. Monkeys have, monkeys have tails and are uh, generally, um, le let's say, less humanoid than the apes are. The apes are closer in uh, relationship to humans. Uh, I see. It was something that occurred to me. I, know yeah, I, don't think, I don't think that can happen. I can't tell you for sure, but I don't think it can. Well, thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye, Eric. KBC time is 12 minutes after 9 o'clock. 1-800-222-KBC is the number. Toll free. I've got Dave and Reseda on the line here. Hi, Dave. You're on the air. How are you tonight, Ira? Good, thank you. I want to talk about literature a little bit. Oh, great. I'd love to talk about that. I'm a big reader of books, uh, nonfiction and fiction. We talk about fiction a little bit tonight. Have you ever read Lord of the Flies by William Golding? Not only have I read it, I've taught it several times, including last week. Yes, uh, I'll start with that because it is a, um, it, a word, the word masterpiece is overused, but that book was a masterpiece. And the re it's funny I would say that because to tell you the truth, I struggle with that book. Well, it's a complicated book. There's a lot more to it than appears on the surface. Uh huh. And there's a lot of disturbing things, like the Christ-like Simon. I'm not going to get the whole mm -hmm. book away. To anybody yep. Simon certainly is Christ-like. Yeah, and he, you know what happens to him? Yeah, he gets beaten to death. Yes, that's how I remember it. It's a disturbing book, but it, it's a real slap on the face of reality in a way. But yet it's totally fictional. It's a beautiful book. Another writer I want to recommend for any re any listener listening to this show is one not talked about too much, really, is James Serber. Oh, yeah. Oh, he wrote beautiful things. Now, he wasn't quite as great as Mark Twain. <laughs> Mark Twain gets all the publicity. Well, Twain is a much greater writer, but Serber is funny. Thurber is a very, very funny man. A beautiful man. You know, he once had a quote, which I like. If I call the wrong number, why do you answer the phone? Huh. Well, you know, Thurber wrote um, mostly humor stuff. But some of the stuff that is humorous is also pretty serious in some sense. Like the, uh, beast, the beast in me. Well, yeah, well, I was thinking of um, uh, Walter Mitty. Secret uh -huh. Life of uh, Walter Mitty, which is funny, but also is uh, quite, uh, what would you say, quite um, uh, empathy-causing, <laughs> if there's such a word. You feel for Walter Mitty. Yeah, well, I had a different take on that, so I thought he was lucky in a way, because his fantasies didn't hurt him. Yeah, but uh, the point is that he can live in his fantasies, and he, he develops a, an, a, another world outside of the real world, which is harsh and cruel to him, he develops a fantasy world in which he can cope and live. Okay, I don't want to sound too good to be true. I'm not arguing with it. You take a point. You're probably right about this. Is that people who don't lead active lives of fantasy can be ground down by reality. It's that the L.A. Times, Newsweek and Time magazine, at least to me, will grind me down. If I mm -hmm. have a rich fantasy a life in any part of my life, I tend to be better off. It's a friend to me. Well, that's what it was for Walter Mitty, of course. Yes. 
All right. Uh, one other writer I'll recommend, John Updike, who is, what, who is a conservative, I think. I think he's a conservative Republican. I don't know what he is politically, but I, I don't care either. some very bad things about Clinton and the New Yorker, which bothers me. But as a writer, he, he is a... Uh, He's sort of a combination of Steinbeck and Hemingway put together. Uh, I wouldn't rate him that highly. <laughs> oh, really? Oh. Okay. I don't think that much about that. I used to like him much better than I do now. When I reread him, I found that I didn't think his work held up very well. Oh, alrighty. Yeah, I, I'm not real big on Updike. I think probably the best thing he ever wrote was the uh, piece he wrote on Ted Williams' last game with the Red Sox. Did you ever read that? Never read that. He, he went to Ted Williams' last game when uh, Williams retired in 1960. And then Williams' last turn at bat, he had a home run. And Updike wrote extensively about that. It was, it's a very good piece. Okay, one last thing, just to switch the subject for one second, on baseball. You know, last I heard that Greg Maddox has gone 58. He's a pitcher for the Braves. 58 in the third innings without giving up a walk, I know. Without giving up a walk. All right. And do you know, a few weeks, a few, a couple of years ago, he pitched a nine-inning game. I think he threw a shutout. I know he won. He threw 15 balls in the game. Yeah, and all the rest were strikes. Yeah. He's got remarkable control. That's why he wins all the time. Yeah, he, he's a beautiful pitcher to watch because he throws off-speed pitches right on the black. He can be behind three balls, no strikes. Yeah. And he'll throw three straight. I can tell ball. you're a baseball guy. Okay, got to leave all you right, here. Thank you, Dave. Bye-bye. We're a little late for the traffic report, so let's do that right now. Rob Barinko, how do the streets, roads, and freeways of Southern California look? I'll tell you, Ira, we have a major problem starting out in uh, Fontana there, the 10 eastbound at Cherry. You're going to find an incident involving an overturned vehicle. It's blocking the three left lanes now, and injuries involved as well with crews on the scene there, so a good place to avoid if you can tonight. Once again, that's the 10 eastbound at Cherry. Santa Paula area, the Santa Paula Freeway, that's the one, the 26 westbound, a 10th Street injury wreck blocking the right lane eastbound. Left lane is closed as well. It's a possible fatal incident there. In Long Beach, the 710 southbound on the Willow Street off-ramp, you're going to find a wreck involving a couple of vehicles off to the right shoulder. And Pomona, the 57 southbound at Brea Canyon Road, disabled vehicle, the right lane is blocked. On the KABC Traffic Watch, and Rob Marinko, Talk Radio 790 KABC. A bad vocabulary can sink you socially and professionally more quickly than bad breath. If you fumble for the right words or use the wrong ones, people make assumptions about your background, your education, even your intelligence. A weak vocabulary costs you money, self-confidence, and respect. Here's a solution that's as simple as listening to this radio message. It's called Million Dollar Vocabulary, the breakthrough learning technology that adds hundreds of impressive new words to your vocabulary in just a few short hours. Million Dollar Vocabulary feeds words and their meanings directly into your memory effortlessly. You'll learn the 55 words that are crucial for success immediately. Then in just a few short hours, you'll know and be able to use 600 new and impressive words with no boring repetition, no drills, and no exercises guaranteed. Try it risk-free for 30 days. Call 1-800-218-1409. 1-800-218-1409. Call now. 1-800-218-1409. Is drinking powdered fiber for regularity making you sing the blues? I drink it in the morning. I mix it up at night. This sticky powdered fiber makes regularity a fright. I got the blues. Got those powdered fiber blues. Why not try FiberCon tablets with a refreshing glass of water instead? FiberCon's easier to take than powder and just as effective. Thanks, FiberCon. You're refreshing me. Compared to psyllium powders, he's only as directed. Do you feel like your debt problems are beyond help? Now there's a nonprofit organization that can help you reduce your monthly payments as much as 50%. It's called Ameridet. Ameridet can help reduce or even eliminate your interest rates. And they'll consolidate your bills into one lower monthly payment. If you have more than $2,000 in debt, call Ameridet now for a free debt consultation. Not available in all states. Call 1-800-262-4800. That's 1-800-262-4800. The news you'll be talking about all day long. Listen to the KABC Morning Show with Dave and Amy. Weekdays from 6 to 10 on Talk Radio 790 KABC. Uh, KBC time now is 19 minutes after 9 o'clock. I'm Ira Fistel filling in for Doug McIntyre today. Chuck is on the line from West Covina. Chuck, you're on the air on Talk Radio 790. Hello, Ira. Hi. Um, I have a question for you, and I, I hope it's not too weird, but uh, in the uh, in the broadcasting realm, 
um, there's a, in, in the FM, there's sub-channels. And what I've noticed on the sub-channels is that it, the two things are going on. What used to be uh, uh, store music, like um, elevator music, is now become either Russian or, or uh, Oriental, Asian-type uh, talking music. And then there's all kinds of like digital uh, sounds, like modem sounds. What's going on in there? And I hope it's not too weird to ask that. Well, it's a question that I can't answer. I know nothing about this. Okay. Uh, what is this you're saying? The, on FM, you hear... You FM hear something sub- other than the regular signal? Right. FM has subchannels, one that creates stereo, FM stereo, but it also has two other subchannels they created for um, miscellaneous stuff, and mostly it used to be the elevator music, but now there's all kinds of... Can you get that on an ordinary receiver? No, it takes... That, that was uh, the other sub-part of the question, is that who has these receivers that pulls this stuff in? You know, because not only are they creating this stuff, but who's got the receivers that actually pull this stuff in? Well, now, how do you get it? Oh, I found it in the circuit of a 1950s uh, book, so I made the circuit for it and then listened to this stuff and wonder, well, what are they doing with it? Huh. Well, somebody's probably buying it yeah, exactly. and using and it, but I don't, know, I don't know where it's going to. You yeah. guys could probably tell me what was going on. With I can't. It. Not me. <laughs> I don't know anything about that. Okay. Uh, you know, the uh, technical side of the broadcasting business is something I know almost nothing about. Uh-huh. And... Uh, and I don't know whether this comes under the technical or what. I'm sorry, what? I'm sorry, what? Who would be a good source to go to that? Who would um, tell me what was going on? Is it KBC or, or, or who? Well, I don't know. I don't know if anybody uh, around here knows that. I suppose maybe somebody in the management might. Oh, okay. I really don't know. Right. But I'll tell you what. Anyway. Keep, keep listening because somebody out there in the audience may know. Okay. And they'll tell us because the audience knows everything. Thank you very much. All right. Good night. Bye-bye. I'm sorry, I can't answer that question, but I can't. Okay, Irv, you're on the air on Talk Radio 790 KABC. Hi. Ira, how are you? Good. i got to tell you, this guy, Howard Rosenberg, just rubs me the wrong way. He's the uh, guy in calendar section of the LA Times. Yeah, he's a Times TV critic. And he, he's basically crying about the negative stereotyping distorts Arab image. And I'm wondering if I could possibly convince you to, to believe me that this stereotyping, if you will, of the Arab image is not far off base. There is truth in certain stereotyping. When I think uh, about all the incidents that have happened around the world, and he draws reference to the Oklahoma bombing and, and the fact that most Americans immediately thought that it was Arabic in nature. The first thing I, we, yeah, the first thing we were, th- were, were actually suggested to. Right. When, when I think, and, and perhaps the vast majority of people in this country think, of what happens when you have a terrorist incident in the Middle East, you automatically think of Islam. You think of Arabic images. This is the record of the Arabic people. Now, I'm not saying that 3.5 million Arabs living in the United States are dyed-in-the-wool uh, bombers who are going to get up in the middle of the night and bomb the first target they see. What's more, I would think the same thing is true of approximately a million Palestinians. Pardon me? Probably the same thing is true of a million Palestinians. But the fact is there is terrorism in the Arab world. Uh, there are inst- you know, groups within the Arab world who do carry out acts of terrorism. That's, that, that goes That's an saying. undeniable truth of, yeah. of, of life. I mean, you cannot avoid that. So the, the problem is how do you... come from them. So, right, so the problem is how do you treat this fairly... Uh, you don't want to tar anybody who is Islamic or Arabic with uh, the the brush of uh, of um, terrorism, and at the same time, you can't avoid the fact that there are people who do commit terrorism, and uh, a number of them are Islamic fanatics and Arabs. I don't know if you're, you're really familiar with the Koran. I don't know if you're really familiar with the teachings of the uh, the sheikhs and the mullahs and those people who uh, literally teach the Arab masses about what is right and what is wrong according to the Koran. But if you've taken notice, in the, in the recent past, there isn't one Islamic leader, whether he lives in the United States or whether he lives in the Middle East, who will get up and have the integrity to say, that self-destruction and suicide bombings are not only horrible to, to the innocence that they take, but it is destructive to, quote, whatever cause we're trying to advance. Well, there's more. Than, there's saying? even more than that. Goldstein, Brooke Goldstein, the, the so-called Jewish terrorist, when he did his thing in 19-whatever, when he went into the mosque, 
Jews had foot races to condemn him, and you know that. And well, know as a that. matter of fact, uh, there are Islamic teachers who disagree with the, uh, prov uh, uh, what would you say, the uh, mullahs or whoever they are who promote the, uh, the Intifada as a holy war. They, no, don't they, agree. Agree. they don't agree. They don't agree with that this is a holy war under the meaning of the Koran. Not all, not all Hispanic teachers uh, agree with that. But, but they, they do agree with the fact that if a person takes his own life in the, in the act of uh, taking out an Israeli uh, soldier or, or part of the political uh, you know, infrastructure of Israel, they go immediately to what is called Allah. And they're surrounded by 70 vestal virgins, and they're going to have sex and pleasure for the rest of their... Well, ignorance. that is, if, the, if that is a approved uh, holy war, my understanding is that that's, if, it's, if it is a approved holy war, but it is not an approved holy war to all uh, Islamic uh, clerics. Well, you name one Islamic cleric that disagrees with I that. I can't name one who would agree with it, but I know I've read that they, uh, they don't always, in fact, many do not. And, and in fact, not? I've read in... in why, why, are, why are their voices so absent? Well, they aren't absent. You just Pardon don't me? hear a lot of it because it's not covered there very, that much. You wouldn't, you wouldn't find any media covering an Islamic cleric who condemns the... Oh, it's, it's, it appears in the Islam? newspaper. That's how I know it. I don't know their names, but that's how I know because this case. they don't case. get coverage because they're not there. No, they are there. That's how I found they're out about there. it. You know, <laughs> from one Jew to another, I'm telling you the truth. They are no. not there. Yes, they are there. You yes. can't name one. I can't name them because I don't know the names because of these people. I don't remember them. But they're them. there, and that's how I found out about uh, it because it was covered. I have confronted the ADC guy on Doug McIntyre's show just the other night, and he says the reason why we approve of suicide bombers is because the Israelis have F-16s. Well, and this is the only in practice, that is true. In, in practice, that's exactly why. Because they're powerless. The only power they have is the power of suicide. So the power of suicide means destroying innocent lives. That's justifiable because the Israelis well, have F-16s. But that's what their argument is to those but who that's believe not it. An argument to that's those. Not well, wait a minute. Though, to those who believe that it's a holy war, yes, it is an argument. To those who believe it's a holy war, they take their own lives and take the lives of innocent 16-year-old kids trying to get into a nightclub. Yep. That's not a holy war. Well, that's, that's, not, that's not to you, but it is to them. And, and that makes the Koran barbaric, in my not opinion. Not necessarily. It depends on how you interpret it. It's the only way to interpret no, it. No, it's not the only way, as I just got through telling you. There are Muslim uh, teachers who do not believe that that's yeah, justifiable in the Koran. In his, in his wisdom, can't name one. I can't name them because I don't know the names. You're but I've seen, I've seen, seen it in the papers. I've seen You're the... You're shorthanded. You would know the names of these No, names. I wouldn't. Don't, don't expect too much of me. I don't know everybody's name. <laughs> But uh, seriously, you know, it, it is not a universal opinion. I can tell you that. Now, I'm sure somebody will call and, uh, you can't and speak find about that. One Islamic cleric. I don't know the name month. of any Islamic cleric one way or another. Pardon me. I don't know the name of any Islamic cleric one way or the other. Okay, if you don't know the name of one Islamic cleric one way or another, sure, certainly the media would know. They do, and that's how the media hasn't. Put that is why I cleric. said what I said because that's where I saw it. I read it in the papers. You read what in the paper? The the uh, denunciation of the holy war by Muslim clerics who are do who don't agree with that. Yeah, I I'd love to see that. Well, I, I I saw would it. Love to see that. I saw it. So uh, keep it keep your eyes open, Earth. Yes. Come on. Yes, you I saw. You can't kid the kidder here. Come I'm on. not kidding you. That's <laughs> it, it is true, and, and I they can't. They love this thing. Well, I'm sorry, but they it's true. They love it, and you know it. I'm sorry, Irv, but it's true. Okay? okay, whether you like it or not. Okay. You disagree. Bye bye. It's not a matter of disagreeing. It's a matter of uh, just recognizing the fact that not all Muslim teachers agree that the uh, Intifada is, qualifies as a holy war under the Quran. Okay, uh, somebody will probably add more to that down the line here. It's 28 minutes after 9 o'clock on Talk Radio 790 KABC. I'm Ira Fistel. Louise is on the line here. Hi, Louise. Hi, Ira. I enjoy your program. Thank you. I'm calling about the uh, psychics. And you're going to have one up. Oh, Kenny. Yeah, I'm going to have Kenny Kingston on. But Although he's not really a psychic. He's uh, a, a um, spiritualist. Well, why can't these people, like, find this little uh, Ramsey girl and find out what happened to these people and, like, Chandra... <laughs> I got news for you because most of them aren't, aren't really what they say they are. <laughs> Don't have that kind of powers. They've been used. You know, there have been some psychics who have been used to try to solve crimes with not great success. Because when they're on TV and they have these people in the audience, and I always think, well, they're planted there because they'll say, oh, yeah, so and so died, and I see a lot of glass around them. And then the person will say, oh, yeah, they died in a car crash. You know, a lot of glass breaking, and, and it's just... 
I well, don't know, just kind of fascinating. You I don't can, believe in it, but a fascinating. Yeah, me you can believe or not believe. There are a lot of people who believe in it. There are a lot of people who don't believe that there is such a thing. And there are those like me who is skeptical but is not going to say it can't be. You know. Yeah, well, it seems like if it could be, that they'd come forward and solve these problems. Well, but they don't have the ability to solve, apparently, a lot of these problems, you know. <laughs> um, again, it's been tried. It's been tried. It's been the psychics have been used to try to solve crimes. I don't believe it's been terribly successful, universally successful. I wonder if, if they've tried this in uh, the Ramsey case and the uh, um, Chandra's case. Well, <laughs> obviously they, they haven't. They don't tell you anything about. If them. they have, it hasn't been successful because she's still missing. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. And I wondered. Um, all right, I have to break well, in here. I've got to break in here. We have a uh, traffic report and news report to do right now. Okay, I'm going to go. Okay, thank okay. you, Louise. Thank you. Bye-bye. And now at 9.30, here's Rob Marinko with the news and traffic. Thank you very much, Ira. The LAPD is asking for the public's help in solving a couple of separate Southland killings. Steve Gonzalez has the story. The most unique talk in town, Mr. KABC. Weeknight 7 to 9 on Talk Radio 790 KABC. Okay, ABC time is 25 minutes before 10 o'clock. I'm Ira Fistel filling in for Doug McIntyre this evening. Let's go to our next caller, and this is Jan in Hollywood. Hi, Jan. You're on the air on KABC. Hi, Ira. How are you? Good, thank you. It's a pleasure to hear you on a Monday night, three nights back to back. Yep. That's like a treat. <laughs> it's like getting candy instead of a rock on Halloween. <laughs> well, there'll be more opportunities in August. I've got some more shows in August. Anyway, go ahead. Great. Um, I was listening to Al Rantel's show a couple weeks ago. You want to uh, turn the radio down there? We're getting feedback. Okay, let me turn my yeah, radio. Yeah, you have to turn it down. Not a problem at all. I was going to say I was listening to Al Rantel's show a couple weeks ago. Are you there? Yep. And he was talking about the comedy, act the comedy actor Jim Carrey. Yeah. And he was saying how he had purchased a vehicle for $41 million. Forty-one million dollars. He purchased a vehicle for forty-one. What million was it? <laughs> what was it? A, uh, a a jet on wheels or something? <laughs> I have no idea. What could possibly cost forty-one million dollars? I have no idea. But he purchased a, he purchased a vehicle for forty-one million dollars. And the question I would like to oppose to you is that because the statement that he made is that once he passes on, he can't take it with him. So the question that I would like to you know, present to you is that why is it that society has such a negative attitude when it comes to people who have, who have a lot of material things and a lot of wealth? The attitude seems to be when that person passes on, they can't take it with them. But that, in my opinion, is not a good argument because I feel that you can't take a spouse with you when you pass either, but yet you have women and men whom are looking for love on the Internet. You know you have women that are raped because they've met up with people they've met on the Internet. You have women who cannot have a child, so they'll go to the in vitro fertilization route. If that flops, then they want to hire a, seg a surrogate mom. If that doesn't work, they want to try to adopt. If they don't have Rosie O'Donnell's money, they go overseas. So they go all out of their way to acquire this child that they can't take with them when they pass on. But yet society seems not to have a problem with Well, that. I think there's a big difference between a child and a material possession, isn't there? Well, in my opinion, you can't take none of it with you. So if I mean, you know, I find that someone is more crazy for doing all this stuff to try to have a child than they are buying a car. If you want a $41 million car and you have the money, why not? I mean... To make the argument, you can't take it with you. I mean, it doesn't wash, in my opinion. You can't take anything with you. You can't take your wife and children with you mm -hmm. when you die. Society has no problems with that. I don't, I don't understand that analogy. Okay, Why uh, that? let me talk about that with you just for a minute here, Jan. Uh, I'm not sure I can, I can do this, but I'm going to give it a try. The difference is that a material possession really doesn't give you much in the way of uh, meaning, it doesn't give you any meaning after you own it. You may want to own it uh, and, and want it, you know, and long for it. But once you own it, it has no meaning. It's just another material possession. You see what I mean? 
Well, Whereas I, with a, a, a child or a person, you don't own it in the first place. Well, but, I, I but, but, wait a minute, but, 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 you interact with it and you leave behind something of yourself in what you reacted with that other person. So and whether you can't take it with you, they can, they can keep you with them. Uh, there's a lot more meaning in a relationship between people than there is between a, uh, an, a car and its owner. A car doesn't feel anything and doesn't give anything. All the car does is sit in the driveway uh, and look pretty, or you drive it on the highway and it looks pretty. But either way, it doesn't give you any love. It, it's incapable of giving you love or affection or, or anything. So I think there's a big difference between a material possession and a, and a uh, person. But the analogy that people are making is that you can't take it with you. This is the analogy that they're making. And so I feel if that's going to be the argument, then you can't take anything with you. You can't take right. a house with you. Okay, I tried to just explain the difference there. I don't see... I mean, I understand what you're explaining to me, but it doesn't make a good argument, in my opinion. Okay. I don't... I mean, you were making the, the analogy about the $41 million car, but... I've never owned one in, in nine. I've never owned one, and I wouldn't want to. Well, I understand that, but you really can't say what will happen with the forty million, a forty-one million dollar car. As I was listening to Whoopi Goldberg, and she had made a statement that someone had made a statement to her that Whoopi, you like your privacy, but uh, not having privacy that comes along with the territory of being a successful entertainer. And, and her remark that she made was that you don't know that territory because you're not successful. So my argument to you is that you don't know that because you never had a $41 million car. It wouldn't make any difference so if I did. What? A car is still not capable of loving you. A car cannot talk to you. A car cannot hold you and kiss you. A car cannot uh, interact with you. It's a possession. It's not human. I understand. The, the, well, that's I, the difference. I understand what you're saying, but I just don't... I just feel like, in my opinion, you know, that's not... To say that, I just have trouble with it because I feel you can't... To say that because you can't take a car with you is not reason enough not to want it, in my opinion. Well, I guess that's the analogy that I'm... That's the point I didn't I'm say making. it's not, not, not enough to not to want it. I'm saying you can't get the same satisfaction out of it. It's not the same as a person. Okay, got to leave you. Thank you very much, Thank Jen. You. KBC time is uh, nine minutes... No, I'm sorry, 19 minutes before 10 o'clock. 1-800-222-KBC is the telephone number. And Doug is on the line next from Anaheim. Hi, Doug. Hi, Ira. What can I do for you? Yeah, I picked up on you a couple of weeks ago. I don't generally listen to radio on weekends, but... Uh, well, I hope you're going to listen to radio on weekends now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I picked up on you before. Well, anyway, I had a question about uh, the uh, Anaheim Angels yeah. and Mo Vaughn. And I just wonder what's become of him. I haven't heard anything. Oh, he's been hurt. He's out for the year. Yeah, I knew that. But uh, still, there's no information about him. Well, he's... he's, uh, he's... Back or... <laughs> Oh, he'll come back next year. He can't come back this year. No, I know that. Yeah. yeah. No, that's all. That's all it is. It's uh, he just is not able to play this year. Yeah. Okay. Well, they need some help. Well, the Angels just aren't good enough to. You know, they're not a good enough team. They thought they were going to be better than they were. Yeah. They, actually, the funny thing is that they've had better pitching than they had any right to expect. True. But their hitting has fallen off instead. Yeah. I mean, Erstad had a tremendous year last year, 355 and uh, over 100 runs driven in as a leadoff man. I mean, he had a tremendous year. This year he's down at 260. Yeah, right. Uh, Salmon has had a terrible year. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you can't lose the, all the offense and uh, make it up entirely in, uh, you know, in, in, a, in a little bit better pitching. True. They have been better uh, on the mound than they thought they were going to be or they had any right to believe they were going to be. Yeah. But uh, they've just lost too much offense. Yeah. Well, I just wish they could make it in the playoffs. I don't, think, uh, I, I don't think you'd count on it if I were you. Like, like the Chicago Cubs or the White Sox? Well, I don't think the White Sox are likely to make it either. The Cubs have a good shot. I think so. Yeah, yeah uh, because they not only have a chance to win the division, they also have a chance at a uh, wild card. Yeah, okay. If they don't win the division. Yeah. They've got a good chance to make the playoffs this year. I'm not, I'm not saying they will. I mean, me of all people. Uh, <laughs> I know you're White Sox fan. Yeah, and I just love to watch the Cubs, uh, you know, blow it. I'm, I'm confident they will, but uh, uh, but they do have a, a good chance to make the playoffs. Yeah, well, I okay. hope they do. Okay? Yeah. All right, That's thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And yeah, the Cubs just picked up Fred McGriff yesterday. That's not going to hurt. Fred McGriff is a veteran hitter, and uh, he will look very good in a Cub uniform, at least for the rest of this year. Ross in Los Angeles, you're on the air next on Talk Radio 790 KBC. Hi. Hi, Ira. Yes, I just heard a um, an interview with a with a woman named uh, Mrs. Johnson. 
about uh, her child having been given uh, Ritalin and other uh, psychotropic drugs. And uh, she was saying that in the schools, that these are public schools, uh, the teachers would recommend that the parent uh, give, a like an overactive child, these drugs. And if they didn't, they were threatened that they would be, uh, be turned into um, child services uh, for abusing their child and not giving them these psychotropic drugs. And I just wondered, because since you're a teacher, what's your opinion is of, uh, of Ritalin and these other drugs that they're giving these children? Well, uh, I have a personal experience with Ritalin because my daughter has taken it. And she's had to take it uh, over the years. And it's been very good for her. I, I don't have any problem with it. If, if the child is really in need of it, uh, then it's the proper thing to do. You, well, you know what they said, and you know what a change before these things even existed, that from 15 to 20 percent of all the boys in the public schools are on these drugs now. Well, I don't know if that's the case, but if it is, I wonder whether they all really need it. See, that's the question, whether it's really necessary. It sounds like it's overdone. It sounds like it might be very much overdone. Uh, I, do know, I do know that it can work and can, do, and can be very beneficial from uh, our experience with my, one of my daughters. Uh, what about in your private school? What percentage of children? I have no there? idea. Uh, nobody ever says anything like that. Yeah. Uh, could I just say hi to Irv? Heidi and I say hi, Irv. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. All right, Ross. Bye -bye. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Uh, KBC time is 9.45, and that's time for the latest traffic report. So let's check in with Rob Marinko. Thank you, Ira. We've got a major problem still to report in Fontana for the 10 eastbound at Cherry Avenue. You're going to find what's left of an injury wreck involving an overturned vehicle. Crew still cleaning up. The left two lanes remain blocked. She'll take on anyone. He'll keep her in line. Gloria Allred and Mark Taylor, weekdays from 1 to 3 on Talk Radio 790 KABC. All right, now it's 11 minutes before 10 o'clock at 1-800-222-KABC. Uh, and let's take our next call from Jan in Sherman Oaks. Hello, Jan, what can we do for you? Hi, I just wanted to respond to the last caller that spoke about giving your child medication. And I'm a special education teacher. And I've often served as a resource specialist, which is one person on a multidisciplinary team with a psychologist on the school level that would help with learning problems. At no time are we ever, ever, ever allowed to dispense medication. Well, I don't think he said that they were. He said they threatened, uh, what, the, what they said that the schools threatened to take the parents to the county. If they refuse to uh, give the drug, is that what he said? I think it was something like that. Well, what I just want to make perfectly clear is that the only thing that we're capable on the school side is to make a recommendation that somebody take their child to have a physical. Mm -hmm. And what I would say is if we're talking about learning, you know, um, facilitation of drugs that may be in the capacity of learning, I would take them to a psychiatrist that's specialized in that area. It's not something to be taken lightly and just because I may say or another one of my colleagues well you know what maybe he would benefit from medication it really does need to be investigated flip side would be how many wonderful success stories I have of kids that could not focus that are able to well that's been our experience yeah I think it's wonderful I, you, you know I'd love to hear about it someday well I mentioned it just now I'll mention it again one of my daughters um, was unable to concentrate in school and she was diagnosed as uh, being ADD, attention deficit disorder, mm -hmm. and the prescription was Ritalin, and she took it, and uh, as far as I know, is still taking it, and uh, it's, it's been very beneficial. And, and that's great. And so I believe that there is one state that has now, I don't know if they've totally stopped it, which is Connecticut. This could be totally non correct information, but they're looking into not allowing medication. Well, I think it, the, the tendency has been, or the, uh, at least the fear is, that uh, the prescription has been abused by giving it to kids who don't really need it right. to keep them quiet. Right. And if, that's, if that goes on, that's wrong. I mean, yeah, uh, it's, 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 it's a solution to a medical problem, and that's the way it should be used. Right, and what people have to know is when you said ADD, you said attention deficit de or, um, disorder. If you have an H in there, that's when you get the hyperactivity. Mm -hmm. uh, a what is it, ADHD? ADHD. ADHD. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, we didn't have that problem. It wasn't uh, that she was violent or anything. 
but she was just having trouble concentrating. Right, and then, and, and that could also just be that they're squirmy and there's different levels. But I just wanted to take that minute and thank you very much All to right. all parents that there's two sides of the coin. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thanks for your call. Bye-bye. <laughs> ABC time is five minutes after 10 o'clock. I'm Arna Fistel, filling in until 12 midnight for our good friend uh, Doug McIntyre. 1-800-222-KABC is the telephone number. We'll talk about anything and everything. 1-800-222-5222. And on the line we have Tom. We were just talking about uh, economics of baseball a moment ago. Uh, Tom, you know, baseball does have a serious problem. The problem is that New York has 15 million people or 16 million people. And Kansas City has uh, maybe a million, and Montreal has maybe less, you know. Uh, how do you get over that huge advantage in money that the Yankees and the Mets and uh, some of the other teams have? Yes, I know. It's, uh, uh, right, now, there, I have I several ideas that. about okay. this. I've had several ideas about this. One, it's too late for. It would have worked. And that would be when you had the two leagues, right, you had the American and National League, a player would have signed with the league, not with an individual club. You see, and therefore there would be a rivalry for his services between the two leagues, so he would have the ability to sign with more than one, you know, one, uh, one club. But it would be a signature. His contract would be with the league, and then the league could assign him to a team that needed uh, strengthening to keep competitive balance. That would have been one way to do it. It would have been legal under the antitrust laws. It could have been done, but it wasn't done. Now you don't have the two leagues in any but name anymore, and that would not be a valid way of doing it anymore. Uh, one of the ideas that uh, Selig has put forth is contraction. That is to say, get rid of a couple of franchises that nobody would miss, uh, notably Montreal and Tampa Bay. Yeah, I've... But I don't think the Players Association will go for that. No, I don't either. And I don't think you're going to see it. Uh, the next thing has been revenue sharing. But the obviously the major, cl the big money clubs don't want any part of that. Sure, I, and I don't blame them. Well, but then what are you going to do? Well, See, baseball is an unusual business because, unlike most businesses, your competitors are also your partners. Yeah. See, and that's what makes it different. Uh, I don't know that there's an answer. I don't know that there's an answer. The problem is really not between the owners and the players. It's between the owners and the owners. Mm -hmm. Because... Uh, you know, when you you have an owner, uh, a player says to Chan Ho Park, says, uh, his agent says he wants $20 million a year. Okay, as long as you have sane and rational owners who realize that no player is likely to give them that $20 million back, that's fine. But what if you have an owner who's got billions of dollars and is, con is convinced by either himself or by somebody in his organization that uh, this player will make his team successful and make money for him, and he gives him the money. Yeah. Now, down the road, it has turned out that the owners have done very well paying those salaries because the price of franchises keeps escalating. You don't care whether you make money on day-to-day -day operations because your money is doubling and tripling in the price of franchises. That's one thing. Year to year. Right. Then there's a second thing that nobody knows about. That is that when you buy a baseball team, what you're really buying, in addition to the players' contracts, is the right to depreciate those contracts. Mm -hmm. And right. that means you can take off expenses against your business profits. Now, if you're Fox, for example, and you own the Dodgers, mm -hmm. let's say the Dodgers have a payroll of $110 million, as they do, okay? Yeah. But that $110 million is, um, what would you say, uh, can be uh, depreciated over a period of several years against profits. Even if the Dodgers as a team don't make profits, Fox is a corporation that makes a great deal of profits, and they can use the baseball salary write-off against their uh, business profits Which outside the team. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That is why the price of franchises keeps going up to the ceiling, because you make money two ways. You make money by saving on taxes on your other business interests, even if you don't make money on the baseball team, and because the price of the franchise keeps escalating. Mm -hmm. so that is why the owners don't want to open their books. Because uh, if they did, if the owners opened up the books, the public would see that, uh, while they may be losing some uh, small change in operations, 
they're really getting much bigger and bigger returns in the long run. Uh, I was just thinking of it this way. In 1966, I think it was, uh, 60, 65 or 66, mm -hmm. when the Milwaukee Braves were sold to Atlanta, you know what the price of the franchise was when Atlanta bought the franchise for? No, I don't. Six million dollars. Wow. You know what it's worth today? Um, probably uh, $250 million. Min Minimum $250 million. Minimum. Probably. Now, I can't even figure the increase, the percentage increase in that. Yeah. It's 800% or something like uh, that. Right. Uh, now, I mean, anything that increases by value by 800%, even if you deduct half of that for inflation or something, you have done very well. Sure, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, baseball, well, you know, baseball economics are a difficult problem. It is. It's, it's, uh, I don't pretend to have a solution, and uh, it, it's, uh, but it, it bothers me because I, I, I don't want to see uh, revenue sharing. I, 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 think, uh, I just think of what Jim Campbell said years ago when he was trying to build the Tigers into a contender. He said, we always have to look up to the Yankees because they're the class of the league in both uh, player personnel and management. He said it's our objective to overtake him. Well, he didn't have a lot of success, but he did a couple of times. Yeah, the Tigers won a couple of pennants with sure, Jim Cannon. Sure, they did uh, in '68 and '84. Of That's course. right. But um, and and I view the same. I, I kind of view the same thing with uh, the Minnesota Twins and the Baltimore Orioles. Yeah. Baltimore, Except there's one Baltimore problem. Is, uh, it's got some good young players. But think of it. Think of the problem this way: Minnesota won two pennants. Detroit won two pennants. The Yankees, meanwhile, won about 15. Yep. Well, they start with a huge advantage. Yeah, they do. But they did back in 1968 too. Even though the Yankees were down at that time, I'm, I'm well, that was because down. of free agency. Free agency made money worth more all of a sudden. Yep. Okay. Well, anyway, it's nice to talk to you. Thank and, you. Uh, I miss your your talk on baseball. I wish. Oh, I love more. to talk baseball. But anytime you want to call, you bet. Okay. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye. And the great game. It really is. It's, there's there's nothing quite like baseball. There's no experience quite like it. Uh, the time is 12 minutes after 10 o'clock. 1-800-222-KABC is the telephone number. And guess what? We're going to turn from baseball to opera. Hello, Pat. Well, hi, Ira. I don't know if there's another talk show host in America who can go from baseball to opera from one I call to know. another. You, you are incredible. <laughs> this is, you know, that's one of the things I'm most proud of, the fact that I have that, you know, they can do that kind of thing, that kind of range, because I can't... Frankly, I don't. I can't think of anybody else who could do that. I what I called about, you know, well, there were a couple of things with the opera. Uh, you talk, you know, this other lady has been calling you. You know, where you uh, told her about La Boheme. Oh yes, like, opera uh, in four minutes, right? <laughs> yeah, and uh, but it, in the arias, you know, when when uh, of course the, he and his Bohemian friends, Rudolfo and his Bohemian friends, they were just goofing around and. Where the landlord and so forth tried to, you know, and made an excuse. Yeah, you're talking about La Boheme. Yeah, about go ahead. His wife, and remember? Yeah. And then they they went out to uh, to Gay Paris, you know, and uh, they go to the Cafe Momus. Yeah. Anyway, uh, then there's a rap on the door, a little rap on the door, and it's Mimi, and uh, Rudolfo brings her in, and he feels her hands. Kajali Dalmanina. Oh, that's poor, cold little hand. And, you know, yeah. and warm it with my own. Right. And uh, then he tells about his life with his Bohemian friends, and then she says, "See, si, be he, uh, he ama no me me, but uh, they call me me me. No me is uh, Lucia. Right. Know? My name is Lucia. And my name, but my life is very simple. She said, I live way up in the attic, and I make." Flowers, paper flowers for a living. I embroider flowers. I embroider flowers, and I also uh, I pray to the Lord. You know, I don't go to church often, but I do pray. Yeah, and I, yeah, that's true. And uh, then she she tells, but she's blessed by one thing because of the you know that she's up high. She gets the so sunshine. She gets the, yeah, she's kissed by the sun. The first sun of the winter it, yeah, the spring it, it, is mine. It, it, yeah, the, the Il primo uh, the, sole the mia. Yeah, 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 you know. And that's what she's singing about. And uh, then they go on and they sing the O Suave Fanchula where the they duet. declare their love yeah. for one another. So then the scene changes and they decide to go out to the to the gay parade or the, that cafe whatever in the day Momoose, Momoose, Momoose Momoose, 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 Momoose,
Yes. Yeah. Da 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 da. And then they're uh, they're they come in there and uh, they're seated with some gentleman. I guess uh, Musetta. You know, she's more or less a vamp. You know. Well, Musetta is uh, Marcello's former girlfriend. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And she's uh, she's off with the uh, the rich man. Uh, El Chindoro, and they the stuck state him counselor. With the bill. Right, they stick him with the bill. Right, and uh, uh, Rudolfo bought Mimi a, a, a bonnet. Yes, and, and uh, La Mia Cupietta. La Mia Cupietta, a, a pink going. bonnet. Huh? A, a pink bonnet. Yeah, a pink bonnet. <laughs> you know, and oh, anyway, um, Musetta of course makes her grand op, uh, grand entrance. You know, and as I walk through the streets, all the men look at me. You know, just. The Quando Benvo. Quando Benvo, yes. Quando Benvo. Uh, I forget. I, I used to sing that one too. Sounds better when you. Yeah. Sounds better when you do it. Hey, oh, Hang on a second. We've got a uh, we got a weather report to break in, a traffic report rather to break in. We'll come right back to you. Okay. okay? <laughs> uh, I bet you never to, uh, expected to hear this: a uh, soprano singing Musetta's Waltz song from Level A. Yeah. It's 16 minutes after 10 o'clock on Talk Radio 790 KABZ. Uh, how do you like opera, Rob Marinko? <laughs> it's a change of pace, Ira. Uh, we've got to follow a new haul. Golden State Freeway northbound before Antelope Valley Freeway. There's an object in the roadway believed to be a car seat in the middle lanes. Watch out for that. Studio City, Hollywood Freeway northbound, uh, Hollywood Freeway southbound at Lancashire Boulevard. I'm sorry, disabled vehicle in lanes. But we don't have any more details on this, so be extra careful there. Gloria Allred and Mark Taylor, weekdays from 1 to 3 on Talk Radio 790 KABC. And the time is 21 minutes after 10 o'clock. We've got some lines open now for the first time tonight. Uh, the lines have been ringing off the hook all morning, or evening rather. Uh, but right now, there are some lines open, so you can call at uh, 1-800-222-KABC and get on the air quickly. 1-800-222-5222. We've got Pat on the line here. And uh, what are, you, what are we going to get to here with this uh and we're not going to do the whole of La Boheme on the air here, Pat. Oh, no, no, no. But the deal. Oh, my God. And then, you know... Adio. Remember that. Adio, senza rancor. Yes. You go up and I go down. With no, with no rancor, with no heart. Yeah, without beat. anger, right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, and By the way, uh, I think the music... beautiful duet with uh, Marcello and Rudolfo. And my personal feeling is that the music of the third act is the best music in the opera. Oh, I think the third act is absolutely stunning. I, I, one of my best arias was uh, the the Adio. And then she sings, uh, yeah. Well, she sings uh, "Donde Lie to the She." Uh, then yeah. uh, you know, I'm I'm going to go back where I came from. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. that's just beautiful. Donde lie to the She? To a grito d'amore. I'm sitting down and with my wrist down, and I'm, and I'm 77 years old, so what the heck do you expect? <laughs> you still sound all right. Anyway. Well, I can carry a tune, but, uh, and we won't go into Tosca tonight. We'll yeah. do that another time. About Saturday morning, though, you know, where they did those last four operas. Oh, Verdi, Verdi. yeah, it was marvelous, marvelous yeah. show. Oh, Duff did a great yeah. job that, way, that morning. And then I came out and turned on the TV, and who should be singing but... Uh, uh, Collis singing uh, an aria from uh, Medea. Oh, yeah. That and was her a... eyes, the expression in her eyes. And yeah, well, that was one of her best roles, I always oh, thought. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll let you go. We'll talk <laughs> another time. But It's fun, Pat. Thank you. I always have fun talking to you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay, we've got uh, room for some calls. Uh, 1-800-222-KABC. <laughs> I'm not going to take this next one until after the one who's been waiting longer, but wait till you hear what's coming up. Hello, Henry. You're on the air on KABC. Hello? Yes, sir. Yeah, this I remember talked to you for a long time. It was just a little bounce back from the opera to baseball. Okay. Uh, they always talk about odds and the Cubs winning the World Series and all that. Well, you know, that's impossible. The Cubs I come can't up with win. odds that would be bigger than the Cubs winning the World Series. You know what that is? What? A perfect, perfect game. 
27 strikeouts. Oh, well, that's never been done in the major leagues. No, never, not ever in any kind of league. Well, yes, it has. It has been done in the minors. It has? Yeah, it has been done in the minor leagues. Uh, 27 strikeouts? Yeah, 27 strikeouts. Actually, that's not a real perfect game. You know what a perfect game is? 27 pitches, 27 outs. That's a perfect, perfect game. <laughs> well, strikeouts would be a perfect, perfect well, game. Well, I know what you're saying. But, yeah, I know what you're saying. But to me, uh, you know, striking out batters is a, is a waste of energy. Yeah. The idea is to throw 27 pitches and get 27 outs with 27 pitches. Then you've yeah. really done something. But now that's I'm never happened. I'm a Detroit Tiger fan. Oh, way, are you? Oh, way back, probably farther than you. Well, let's see. You go back as far as Hank Greenberg? I'm 79. Well, do you remember Hank Greenberg playing? Oh, yeah. Greenberg, Goslin. Uh, let's see. The... Uh, Hank Greenberg, yeah. Hank Greenberg. Charlie Geringer. Yeah, Billy Rogal. And Billy Rogal. Charlie Geringer. Yeah, that's the 1939-40 team. Yeah, way back there. Uh, they, that was the team that uh, lost the World Series to the Cincinnati Reds. Yeah. 1940. Yep. I grew up in Kalamazoo, Michigan. So oh, yeah. yeah. Been around there. Sure, I know, I know the area. Halfway between Detroit and Chicago. Yeah, I know. Well, glad to hear you back. Oh, thank you very much. And anytime yeah. you want to talk some baseball, this is the place. You have a good one now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Night. I love to talk baseball. It's 25 minutes after 10 o'clock. Of course, there are a lot of things I love to talk about. <laughs> and one of the things I love to talk about, well, the person I was going to take next hung up. Uh, <laughs> it was a lady named Shirley who said, uh, opera is great, but singers like you, we can do without. <laughs> Sounds like my daughter, uh, my daughter Alexandra, who since she was about five or six years old has had one reaction when I do that. She says, Daddy... Don't sing. <laughs> All right. Um, another thing I love to talk about is Mark Twain. And here is Petra. Hello, Petra. You're on, on KABC. Hello? Yeah, you're on the air. Hi. Hi. Okay. Your class. Of course I know you. Okay. I'm calling to talk about Puddinghead Wilson because in class today you told us to call and ask him about the book. If you, I said if you wanted to ask about it. Oh, right. Okay. Well, I, what do you want to know about Puddinghead? Um, I want for you to explain it to me. I'd like a summary. <laughs> well, I think I did that in school today, but uh, Puddinghead Wilson is a brilliant novel of irony. Uh, I don't think there is a more... Uh, a more successful use of irony in any novel I can think of in, in American history, uh, offhand. Everything in that book is ironic, from the first page to the last. You can never take anything straight in that novel because he's always, Mark Twain is always throwing irony at you. Irony is, can be defined as the reversal of expectations. Uh, what you think you're going to get is exactly the opposite of what you do get. And, uh, the book starts with um, the young man, uh, the two babies, the two babies being uh, switched in their cradle by Roxy, who is the mother of one and the nurse of the other. She switches them so that her son cannot be sold down the river at any time. Well, of course, uh, in the course of the novel, he sells her down the river, and at the end of the book, he is sold down the river himself, despite the fact that everything she's done to keep him from being sold down the river. Uh, it is just one irony after another. Puddinhead Wilson. His nickname comes from the fact that uh, the town people of the town think he's a Puddinhead. They think he's a Puddinhead because he's too smart for them. They, they don't get his joke. They're the Puddinheads. And yet, ironically, uh, toward the end of the book, he fails to solve the mystery because he acts like a Puddinhead and not thinking of all the possibilities. And then... Uh, at the end of the book, they, he uh, manages to convict the right person, and he's no longer called a puddin' The people of the town recognize that they're the puddin' nets. But in the meantime, he actually has been a puddin' net. Another irony. Are you still there? Yeah. Are you eating this up? Yeah, yeah, I'm listening. I'm running it down. <laughs> irony after irony. Yeah, I have that. Yeah. Uh, it's a terrific book. It's a small book. Uh, it's also very, very unusual in the way he uses... Puddinghead Wilson's calendar. And at the head of each chapter are quotes from Puddinghead's calendar, most of which are themselves ironic again. Ironies again. Uh, one chapter I think we talked about today, in chapter 20, the trial chapter, the uh, little epigraph at the beginning is an irony about circumstantial evidence. 
And, of course, the case against the twins is circumstantial evidence, and it is re- it's wrong. It's, it's just as uh, the uh, little, uh, little epigraph says. You never should trust circumstantial evidence because it doesn't necessarily mean what you think it means. So there's another irony. Uh, the irony of the twins. Here are these two twins who you can't... He doesn't actually say they're Siamese, but if you read between the lines, they are Siamese twins. And what happens if one Siamese twin gets killed? What happens to the other one? It, like, feels it, doesn't it? It dies. Oh, yeah, right. You can't kill one without killing the other. I get it. Huh? Yeah. So that when um, Count Luigi kills a man, Angelo says, he didn't kill the man to save his own life. He was thinking of my life. Because if, he, if the man killed him, what would happen to me? He would die? Well, sure. Right. If they're Siamese twins and they share the you know, they share same organs... If one dies, the other dies. That is what happened to Chang and Eng, the, the original Siamese twins. Uh, I believe it was Chang who conducted, uh, who contacted uh, pneumonia, and uh, Eng died on the same day because yeah. when Chang died, Eng died. Yeah, that sucks. Well, <laughs> it's a hazard of being Siamese twins and sharing organs. Let's put it that way. Uh, so, what more do you want to say about it? It's a it's a marvelous little book, um, written when Mark Twain was fifty eight and fifty nine years old. And already, uh, you know, getting to the point where his life was falling apart, and yet he kept experimenting. He chose to do something completely different than he'd ever done before, than any other author had ever done, be- author had ever done before in America. Uh, the man is phenomenal. Was he like an irony specialist or whatever? Like it's one of his three great okay. tools. Mark Twain is a master of three great tools of literature, irony, satire, and humor. And all three of them are present in most of his works, but uh, uh, Puddin' Ed Wilson just crawls with irony particularly, as Huck Finn crawls with both humor and satire, and the Connecticut Yankee is full of satire. Yeah. Brilliant writer. The, sure. I, think, I think far and away America's greatest writer. Okay? Do I get extra credit for this call? <laughs> no. <laughs> but you might have learned something. Thank you very much, Patron. All right, bye. Bye-bye. No, I don't do that kind of thing. No, no. It's uh, 29 minutes before 11 o'clock, and standing by with the latest news is Rob Marinko. Thank you very much, Ira. Two teenage boys charged with murdering a popular Compton substitute teacher are now jailed. Prosecutors say the 16- and 17-year-olds are believed to have broken into the home of 68-year-old Catherine Dawson on July 21st. Dawson was fatally shot during that robbery. The former head of the Beverly Hills Eye Clinic was sentenced in Los Angeles today to 37 months in federal prison for staging the theft of his own Picasso and Monet paintings. Prosecutors say Stephen Cooperman, a former eye surgeon, fraudulently collected $17.5 million from insurance companies. In 1992, Cooperman reported to both the LAPD and the FBI that the master paintings were stolen from his Brentwood home. He's agreed to pay millions of dollars in restitution. California is ranked 44th in the nation on a new list of the most entrepreneur-friendly states. The Small Business Survival Index 2001 ranked Nevada number one. The index considers 17 major government-imposed or government-related costs that impact small businesses and entrepreneurs. ABC News Time, 1031. Here's the ABC 7 forecast. Night and morning, low clouds and fog lasting through the early morning hours. 25 minutes before 11 o'clock. I'm Ira Fistel, filling in for Doug McIntyre. Uh, till 12 midnight tonight at 1-800-222-KBC. Last night, if you were listening, uh, somebody called up and said that there was a uh, wreath, I guess, put on Paul Anka's star on the on Hollywood Boulevard, and he wondered if Paul Anka had died. Well, I figured out another reason why that thing was there. Not only is Paul Anka going to be in Los Angeles in August to do a concert, but today's his birthday. Maybe that's why the, the wreath was there, because he's, he's celebrating his birthday today. Uh, he is 60 years old today, born in 1941 on the 30th of July. So happy birthday to Paul Anka. All right, let's go to Michelle in San Pedro. Hello, Michelle. Hello. Hello, Ira. What can I do for you? I beg pardon? What can I do for you? Okay. Uh, I uh, have uh, some uh, letters from written during the Civil War by my great grandfather, and they're very interesting to read. But I've had them for some time. Uh, just 
packed away, and I feel that they should probably be in a museum. Uh-huh. And I was wondering if I know that uh, you're a Civil War uh, expert, I, if you could uh, recommend a museum for well, this sort of thing. Well, you're in San Pedro, right near you, in Wilmington, is Drum Barracks. Uh, yes. Oh, would they have... Yes, I know it's there, but I didn't realize that they had a place for anything. I would suggest you call them right away, uh-huh. ask for the uh, the director of the, uh, of the um, museum, and uh, I think um, she'll, she'll give you some ideas either whether they can use them, and I think they may be able to, or that someone else who can. But uh, since it's so close to you, I mean, start with oh, drum barracks yes, right I away. I didn't even think of that. I should have. Yeah, it's, it's right there in Wilmington, not, not five miles away from you. Okay, well, I'll do that then. All right. And I thank you very much. Uh, can you tell us something about your great-grandfather in the letters? Which side was he on? He was uh, fought for the North. Yeah. And, in fact, I have one of the letters in front of me, and uh, he was telling uh, a letter that he wrote to his mother. And he was very young when he went in. I think he ran away and joined the Army. A lot of young men did. He Uh, was 15. He was only 15, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. but his parents were able to get He lied about his age, so his parents were able to get him back. And... uh, then I then he ran away again later, and <laughs> they gave up on trying. He to get really him. wanted to serve, didn't he? Yes. Uh, where did where was he from? He was from uh, Indiana. Uh-huh. Uh huh. And he was he w- served the medal that we have in the family showed that he was with the West Virginia Volunteers. Now, I don't know how he got over there. <laughs> Good question, yeah. What he was doing with the West Virginia Volunteers, he was from Indiana, but uh, maybe he was looking for a regiment that would take him when he was underage and they needed men. Yes, or possibly, uh, I'm not sure he was from Indiana. I know that uh, he later lived there. Oh, well, if he was from Ohio... He might have just run across the line to West Virginia and enlisted there rather than in Ohio where his parents might find him. Y- yes. Oh, and there, if you have, if there's time, there's a, a very short uh, couple of paragraphs I, I would read you might found interesting. Find interesting. Is there time? Well, uh, if you do it real quick. Let's hear it real okay. quick. Okay. He meant the Johnnies kept coming. Uh, this in the middle of the letter. The Johnnies kept coming into our our keep coming into our lines every night that most of them bring their guns with them they say that they made a raid on their commissary the other night and upset a major general and run the ran the bayonet through a lieutenant colonel they say that they are starving their men to death I witnessed the sight the other day I never want to see again. It was a young boy about 17 years old with handcuffs. And, well, anyway, he tells about his execution. Yeah. Very sad. Yeah. Well, uh, I'll tell you what, that is actually, that happened. You know, a, a lot of Confederates toward the end of the war deserted because they were starving. They were literally starving. Yeah. Okay. So, yes, well, fi- nice talking to you, Thank Iris. you. Thank you for the suggestion. Thank you, Michelle. Uh-huh. Bye bye. Bye. ABC time is now twenty minutes before ten o'clock. Curtis in Pasadena, how you doing? Fine. How you doing? Oh, it's good to talk to you again. I haven't talked to you in maybe months. Well, you you don't be on when you you you'll be pretty busy on you on the Saturday and Sunday. Yeah, but uh, you know we're there anyway. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. Uh, what I wanted to uh, say to you that did you know that the DH was the best something in the world for the American League players that has got 3,000 hits. Uh, I don't understand what you're saying. That that it helped them get the 3,000 hits? Uh, the, uh, the, all, uh, all, the only ones that have got 3,000 hits uh, uh, it, uh, since the Jackie Robinson era, well, since the DH, uh, is, is, is uh, uh, well, let's see. American League players. Well, George Brett did it, didn't he? But he DH'd. Well, no, most of his career he played third base. But he DH'd. Uh, he may have a little bit, but... Well, he DH'd for a, a long time. I don't and remember that, but I, I, mean, I know he played third base for a long time. And he, and, and, and he played DH for a long time. Yep. He played first base for a long time. Yeah, he did play some first base, that's right. 
See, see uh, now, let me tell you something. Pete Rose is the only, only uh, 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 guy since the DH which didn't DH. Yeah, I don't think he ever did. No, he's in the National League. Yeah, because he was in the National League. There's no DH, right? And Willie Mays and, and, and Roberto Clemente. And, 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 well, they were all those National League players, of course, yeah. And, and Stan Musial. By the way, I don't know if you saw it, uh, the current issue of Sports Illustrated, well, I know you don't see, but the uh, current issue of Sports Illustrated has some pictures of uh, some of those players from that era, and it's hard to believe, but uh, Willie Mays is 70 years old. Sure, well, I know how old yeah. And uh, Yogi Berra is 76. Well, do you know I'm 81? Yeah, I know, I know, but... Um, <laughs> well, well, Willie Mays... Uh, I'm but, I, you know, Willie Mays, to me, is always going to be 22 years old. Well, I'm, I'm 11 years older than Willie Mays. Yeah. And so, but, but, try, uh, uh, now, I'm going to tell you another thing that uh, that you don't, uh, that, see, I can't see. I know that, yeah. But I know my history in my baseball. Yes, you do. Now, uh, you take Mark McGuire. Yeah. Is the only real white baseball home run hitter. Well, <laughs> let's this, see. This, this, uh, 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 he hasn't even caught Harmon Killebrew yet. Well, well, he will. Yeah, he will. He will. Yeah. But and Killebrew hit 573, if I remember. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the, the research have, have gone and it have come in. Baby Ruth was all of us. He was part black, he was part Indian, and he was part German. Well, he, nobody really knows for sure, but there's always been that suspicion, yeah. And, and Ty Cobb, well, to speak of, Well, Cobb was not a home run hitter. Uh, uh, Tris Speaker said, uh, and, and, and all those players back in the day, they did not recognize him as a white player. And now... Well, his, Cobb, of course, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't, because Cobb just uh, was a nasty racist anyway. But now it has been confirmed, or I've been listening to it over the radio, that he... And so I, don't, I, I, I enjoy that, is because that they kept blacks and, and hip Hispanics out so long that they couldn't play, and, and yet, yet they had one among them. All right, now let me, let me ask a question here, Curtis. I know this is going to be a little bit funny, but I've always told you that Ruth was fast and that Ruth could steal bases. Does the fact that you think he's part black change your opinion on him now? You used to say he couldn't steal bases, and I told you he could? Uh, uh, his base stealing wasn't nothing. But he, he could <laughs> steal bases, and he was fast. Uh, let me tell he, you. Didn't, he didn't do it often because it's a waste of outs. But, let me tell you yeah. this. Baby Ruth, to me, is the same as he was, but it was just, I want the facts to come out because, uh, see, they tried to hide it. Uh, see, there's a lot of black players that played in the major league during them years that was passing, but white people didn't acknowledge it. And we, back home, when I was a kid, we would know them. Charlie Grant, uh, he played He played uh, for McGraw. For a while, they kicked him out. Well, McGraw, you know, McGraw was always trying to beat the color line. Yeah. And you know how he did it. He said they were Cubans. Yeah, Charlie Grant went to Chicago, and and all the black people, hey, Charlie, and, well. and, 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 and McGraw had to take him out. All right. Well, Curtis, we're out of time here, but let's talk again. Okay, then. Nice talking to you. Bye-bye. Curtis, an old-time caller. Uh, now, it's 15 minutes before 11 o'clock. 1-800-222-KBC is the telephone number. In a moment, we're going to return with more calls. But in the first, uh, before we get to that, we have a traffic report to do. And here is Rob Marinko. Thank you very much, Ira. A problem in Torrance to tell you about on the 405 southbound at Normandy Avenue. You're going to find an injury incident there. One vehicle, it's off to the right shoulder, but slowing things down. A problem in Redlands for the 10 eastbound across town. Freeway disabled vehicles blacked out in the right lane. A very dangerous situation. Pomona Freeway westbound past Fullerton Road. You're going to find a vehicle fire. It's off to the shoulder. In Calabasas, the 101 eastbound before Las Virginas Road, you're going to see uh, construction cones in the uh, two left lanes. No reports of construction going on, but they got the cones out. South uh, Los Angeles, Century Freeway westbound before Central. Disabled vehicle blocking the carpool lane. And in Van Nuys, the 405 northbound before Victory Boulevard. You're going to find a wreck there. It involves a, a couple of vehicles, mostly in the center divider. On the KABC Traffic Watch, I'm Rob Marinko, Talk Radio 790 KABC. 
Check out the KABC website at KABC.com for the latest news and information coming out of KABC. Find out more about your favorite host, register for the KABC Insider, or check out our brand new advertisers directory. Some of our advertisers have put together some great deals for KABC listeners, so be sure to check out the new directory and look for special offers from Regenix Hair Research Clinic and Bradco Kitchens and Baths. KABC.com, your 24-hour connection to us and the place to find great deals from local businesses. Check out the KABC website at KABC.com for the latest news and information coming out of KABC. Find out more about your favorite host, register for the KABC Insider, or check out our brand new advertisers directory. Some of our advertisers have put together some great deals for KABC listeners, so be sure to check out the new directory and look for special offers from Four Wheel Parts Wholesalers, E. Cola Termite Services, and TheVendingGuy.com. KABC.com, your 24-hour connection to us and the place to find great deals from local businesses. Mario Martinoli here, host of The Restaurant Show. Come join me, my wife Amy, and my family Sunday, August the 12th at the KBC Lister Brunch at Cadiz Holy Restaurant in North Hollywood. We're going to have a wonderful time enjoying delightful Italian food, enjoying refreshing drinks, and talking about Southern California dining. For more information and reservations, please call 818-985-4669 for the KBC Lister Brunch at Cadiz Holy in North Hollywood. That's 818-985-4669 or go online to kabc.com and look on the restaurant page. Super mom, super dad, super kid? It shouldn't take a superhuman effort to raise a child today. For too many of us, it does. It doesn't have to be that way. Look around you and you'll see plenty of communities where neighbors pitch in to help one another. You probably have neighbors who are willing to share a ride, help at school, watch a child, look in on an elderly relative, lend a compassionate ear. Neighborhoods are great resources. Whether it's providing support or receiving it, Building relationships with those around you creates the connections that strengthen families. Kids, adults, teachers, coaches, community leaders, clergy, they all play a role in strengthening families. Strong families care about each other. They stay connected to their communities. Strong communities strengthen families. It starts with all of us. For tips on how to build neighborhood connections, call 800-221-2681. This message is brought to you by the Alliance for Children and Families and the Annie E. Casey Foundation. He is the sharpest knife in the drawer. Al Rantel, weekdays from 10 to 1 on Talk Radio 790 KABC. And the time is 11 minutes before 11 o'clock. Come on at the cell, filling in for Doug McIntyre tonight. 1-800-222-KABC is the telephone number. And Olga in Downey is our next caller. Hi, Olga, you're on the air. Ira, so yes, nice ma'am. to talk to you. Um, going back to Mark Twain, I was just wondering how many of your listeners have ever heard of um, the Diaries of Adam and Eve. Oh, they're, they're fun, uh, especially the one where Eve talks about uh, no, Adam talks about Eve, the new creature. Yes. Yeah, and he can't figure her out. <laughs> yes. yes, and of course, <laughs> men have been trying to figure out women ever since. <laughs> oh, well, sure. And uh, I, I think one thing that's particularly sweet is that. She names all the animals, but she lets Adam think that he he did it. Well, you know, Mark Twain was a very smart a very smart man, and uh, he knew how uh, how marriage relationships go. He knew who runs everything in a marriage, and it ain't the husband. Well, I just <laughs> uh, I found it such a sweet book, and it it showed a side of Mark Twain I think a lot of people didn't see. Uh, very funny, of course. We all know he was. But very sentimental too. Oh yeah. And uh, I, I just think it was—it's just a wonderful little book. But you I think a lot of that, of course, is based on the way he, his own marriage was. Yeah. Because uh, he uh, played around with um, his wife Livy for years, letting her, uh, you know, go through his manuscripts and cutting things out. Uh, he, he would give in to her on all kinds of things, and uh, you know, he he knew. Who was uh, who ran the marriage? Well, I guess <laughs> he was smart. That's all. <laughs> oh, is that what it is? <laughs> oh well, you know, we. Well, I love Mark Twain, and uh, um, I, I happened to think about this because when I came across the book, I got a copy of it for both my daughters, both my daughters-in-law, and uh, my two granddaughters. And they all loved it. I noticed you didn't buy them for your sons. Oh, I didn't. No. <laughs> Heavens, no. But I just wanted to bring it up, and, and uh, if anybody is listening and, 
and uh, to try and get a copy, it's well worth a read. Oh, it's lots of fun. It's lots of fun. It is. Well, thanks, Ira. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah, um, <laughs> Sigmund Freud said it um, maybe a hundred years ago. He couldn't figure it out. What do women want? <laughs> Men have been trying to figure out women as long as there have been two genders. And I have a feeling that will never, ever succeed. <laughs> Let's go to Joseph in Los Angeles. Hi, Joseph. You're on the air at KABC. Hi. Um, I'm a teenager. Yes, sir. And a lot of people think that the reason why teenagers do not want to get their licenses at 18, they don't want to get them at 16, they'd rather get them at 18, is because they're lazy and they don't want to take driver's ed. Oh, I don't know about that. But anyway, go ahead. I'll, I'll give you an example because in, in, the, in the morning, one of the morning shows, they announced that. Well, I know, what uh, again, in our family... My oldest daughter didn't get her license until she was about 19. She didn't want to because she didn't feel she was ready to drive yet. That's exactly my opinion. I don't trust myself to drive a car. Uh, you know, there are plenty of bad drivers out there. Yeah. And why would I want to, you know, put myself in a danger? All right. And, that's, and uh, when you're ready, you will. Right. And you, when you feel confident about it, you will. In fact, I was talking to one of my former students this morning, and she hasn't gotten her license yet for the same reason. She doesn't feel capable at this point. She doesn't feel comfortable driving a car. She'll get it when she needs to get it later. But uh, not every teenager gets his license at the moment he turns 16. Of course, a lot do. I was just making a point that yeah. some people think that, you know, we don't get them because we don't want to take driver's ed. That's totally incorrect. I agree with you entirely. My, from my experience, you're absolutely right. Okay, thank you. Hey, sir. thank you for your call, sir. Call me again. I will. All right. You know, it's great to hear intelligent teenagers, you know. They're out there. There are a lot of very, very intelligent, very savvy, and very capable teenagers out there. Uh, unfortunately, we don't hear much about them. All we hear about is the problem children. But uh, the, the good ones are outnumber the bad ones about 150 to 1. And uh, take it from me, I'm a teacher, I know. Let's go to our next call. The hair is on the line. Hello, hair. Yeah, I found a time when I'm not worn out from unloading trucks. <laughs> the hair is an old time caller who I haven't talked to on the air for maybe a couple of years, huh? Yeah, um, it's been at least over a year because it's been two LA Times book fairs. Mm -hmm. Because the one over a year ago, we were both at the Ray Bradbury lecture, and I didn't have time to tell, never called to tell you that. Uh huh, yeah, I was there. And then la last year, of course, I got to talk to you there. I know. Um, but the main reason I called, technically I said science fiction, but I guess in many ways, ways Marion Zimmer Bradley is hard to classify because she's, a, she's, I guess, science fantasy or fantasy more than she is science fiction. Well, uh, is, there, is there a real difference between science fantasy and science fiction? Oh, yes. So science fantasy technically has the tra trappings of science fiction, but is really at its core, it's fantasy, pure fantasy. Uh-huh. Okay, uh, okay, you know, if you make that distinction, fine. Go ahead. Um, but anyway, um, her Mr. Vavon, and the miniseries that, that based on her book was on, which was extremely fu frustrating for me, because, and I wanted people to understand that they based that, uh, that mi four-hour miniseries, probably only about three hours of actual time, on an 870-page book. What's the name of the book? Mr. Vavilon. Mr. Babylon? Mr. Babylon. It's uh, the Arthurian legend through the women's point of view. Oh, I know that. Yeah, Mr. Babylon, sure. Uh, I read about that. Yeah, it is uh, been a highly acclaimed book. Book She got, uh, got an audience to the Queen of England over it and uh -huh. everything. And it's, and it's been, it holds the record for the most time spent on the New York Times trade paperbacks at bestsellers list. Oh, does it? Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, I, uh, I have heard about this. Uh, of course, I didn't see it because I didn't, you know, I don't watch, but uh, I have heard about this. It's, uh, who, are, who are some of the people? Somebody was Guinevere, who has a slightly different name in this, and somebody yeah. else was... Um, she takes a mo she converts them to more the true Celtic names. Yeah. Instead of how they've been distorted. Started. And one is Morgan Le Fay, who, be, who becomes Morgan something else. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that they don't really deal with in the miniseries series 
and probably confused a lot of people watching the series, is that there were two Christian churches there. One of them that lived lived with the Celts and cohabitated with them, and even had a church uh, on uh, off the side of Avalon in the mist. And then the other church that uh, gave King Arthur so much trouble. And so it's very confusing when all these Celtic women end up in this Christian monastery because it, because they don't understand. Yes, they were exiled from Avalon, so they went to the Christian church that was compatible with... Well, isn't that what happened to uh, Guinevere in the uh, Arthurian yes. legend? Yeah. Yes, yes, it did, but... Um, you have to read the book to understand. There's a drastic, drastic, yeah. drastic difference. But yes, um, I know. I know that it's supposed to represent a feminine point of view. Um, what do they do with Lancelot and Guinevere and their and their affair? Well, she was frustrated over that because, of course, in the original Mallory, um, yeah. it didn't exist. It was something added by the French. It didn't exist in Mallory. No. I didn't know that. Yes, and so she was extremely frustrated over it because she, because it's become so important now. So oh yeah, it's the reason why the add it. It's the reason why everything falls apart. Okay, yeah. um, here we're out of time, but thank you very much. Good talking to you again. Yeah. Okay. okay bye bye. KBC time is now two minutes before eleven o'clock. More calls in the next hour, so stay with us. One eight hundred two 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 KABC is the telephone number, toll free. What do we talk about next hour? To this hour we had Arthurian Legends, Teenage Driving, Adam and Eve's Diary, The Designated Hitters, Puddinhead Wilson, um, and Opera. <laughs> what, an hour, what an hour that was. And there's another one coming. Don't go away. I'm Iris Estelle. Hi, right, everybody. It's six minutes after 11 o'clock. I'm Ira Estelle. Till 12 midnight tonight, taking your calls, anything and everything, at 1-800-222-KABC. Uh, let's go right to the next call, and this is from Ski in Long Beach, and we know him as the guy who has that huge flag. Hi, Ski. Hi, Ira. It's years. I think it is, but uh, then, hey, I've been here. Where have uh, you been? <laughs> well, I... A lot of things happened. Anyway, what's new? Oh, I just come back from uh, Virginia at a Jeep Jamboree. And we flew a 95 by 160 foot flag for, for three days. Now, is that the big one or is that oh, a... No, no, that's my smaller big one. That's the smaller big one. Okay. How big is the big, big one? Uh, it's 505 feet by 255 feet. And that actually flies in the wind? Well, <laughs> I think you'd have to drape that over a building or well, something. Well, we we put it, we hoisted it up on the Hoover Dam. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. In '96, and I got into Guinness Book of Records. Well, that is the biggest flag in the country, isn't in it? In the world. In the world, yeah. Yeah, I'm into Guinness. 505 feet by 255 yeah. feet. That's yeah. a big flag. You know, think of it this way: 505 feet is a 50-story building, roughly. Yeah. If any of your listeners would like to see some pictures, I have a website, superflag.com. And, uh, you know, it, it's, I think it's pretty nice anyway. <laughs> well, you know, if you can find a bridge or something to hang it from. Well, no. Uh, that's well, about what it would take. When I put it up on the dam, we put five quarter-inch table, uh, cables from the bottom. And we put quick snaps. I had the foresight when I had it flag built, grommets every 30 inches. Uh huh. So you can hang it to so tie it up. So we split it up, and we got it all the way up. And then I wanted to put it up another 10 feet, uh, I mean 20 feet, 20, another 30 feet, because I had a banner, a super flag. And when we took it up about another 10 feet, one of the cables broke. Oh. <laughs> and, and it sounded like a rifle shot. Yeah. Then three more broke. Uh-oh. Bringing it down. And the one that was up yet, the flag guy caught on it. Uh-oh. <laughs> and we couldn't get it down. And all we had was about 20 guys 
and we're scared of the wind going to go because there's all these high lines below us. So you got it down? And it was... Uh, How'd you get it down? Well, we finally had to cut that other cable, and then it tore on me for oh, 100 feet. Boy, I mean, that must weigh in a couple of tons. Uh, it weighs a ton and a half. Ton, see, I wasn't uh, too far off. Uh, yeah, two, uh, two towns of proud and tough. Yeah, a yeah. ton and a half. I wasn't too far off. So then, <laughs> after that, I said, well, that's the last time that's going to hang your flyer on well, a Well, you never know. It may not be the last time, you know. Well, no, I put handles on it. Yeah. <laughs> so I opened it three times after... Uh, uh, after Moffitt, that, yeah. At Moffat Field. Yeah. All right. Hey, Ski, it's fun talking with you again. Yeah, likewise. Take care of yourself. <laughs> so, hey. thanks a lot, Ira. Good to hear from you. Bye-bye. Well, hey, what? Well, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's nine minutes after 11 o'clock, and at 1-800-222-KABC is the number. Jeff in La Cunata has a comment here. Hi, Jeff. How you doing, Ira? Pretty good. I uh, called a couple of things. Remember we made that little uh, wager on uh, uh, Minnesota and Seattle? Um, <laughs> I don't remember what I said, but I didn't think uh, Minnesota would hold up. I know that. Yeah, that's what you said. And I think that they are falling behind a little bit. Yeah. Uh, um, probably getting fierce. Yeah. Anyway, go ahead. There are a lot of teams in contention right now. Very strange moves going on right now. A lot of teams in the, indecisive about where to go. Well, they got to make their minds up by tomorrow. Yeah, they do. <laughs> tomorrow is trading deadline. Yeah, the, the inner game of baseball. Yep. Uh, I want to mention a couple of things to you. Um, have you ever read a science fiction book? I'm, when I say science fiction, I want you to understand something. I'm not talking about the weird rocket ships <laughs> things. I'm talking about the kind of science fiction that explores the human condition in different settings. Well, tell me more. It's a book called Ender's Game. Ender's, E-N-D-E-R-S? Ender's Game by Orson Scott Card. And it's a sequel, Speaker for the Dead. It won the Hugo, Hugo and the Neville Award, both of them. Uh, best science fiction awards. It's about a kid named Andrew Wigan. They call him Ender because he ends all the games with skill and strategy. He's the third child in a society that usually allows only two for overpopulation reasons. Uh -huh. Because his sister and his brother were almost what they were looking for, which is a general to defeat a great enemy that's impending on Earth. And they're looking for the right combination of ruthlessness plus compassion because they found that the ruthless, without the human compassion the, and the character flaw, like his brother who tortures small animals, Oh. Are, are not good generals. <laughs> yeah, it would make sense. I would. A warrior who can feel but also can attack. Mm -hmm. and, and there's that kid, you know, he will hurt a kid in the game and he'll cry and try, apologize. And one kid he hurts and they, they hide it from the fact that he killed him. He sent him to a school and um, he becomes that great general. But let's just say that the title of the second book, Speaker for the Dead, gives you an idea. Let's just say that. There's one way to ultimately win a victory against an enemy. It's the most decisive way you can win. And this society places that in the conscience of a 14-year-old kid. And that's quite a scenario for a life. And it's, the book is about how he reacts to it and how he deals with it. It's fascinating. And when you read it, um, you'll look at a Nintendo game never the same way. <laughs> well, I wouldn't look at a Nintendo game in the, anyway, but that's <laughs> that's beside the point. How old the book is? Is it new? It uh, came out in the early 90s. Uh-huh, so a few years old. Fascinating read. I mean, I, you, you, you'll be enthralled with it because it's, it's one of those things where it's just, you're, you're feeling for this kid. All right, the title is Ender's Game? Ender's Game by okay. Orson Scott Card. I'll keep an eye out and for it. I don't know if I'll... He is Speaker for the Dead, and that's the gem. All right. That's when he becomes not the general but the other side, because of the character uh, qualities he has that make him a great general. If you have the feeling for it, you know what I mean? A conscience is a, is a thing that has a double-edged sword, <laughs> and he is moved by his conscience to do something to reverse, you know? But what he did is very hard to reverse, if you know what I mean. Well, I don't know, but I, can't t I know you can't tell without reading the book. So. Let's just say ultimate victory is one level. Yeah, I know you can't tell but without giving away the book. All right. Thank you very much, Jeff. Nice yeah, talking to you. Bye-bye. KBC time is 13 minutes past 11 o'clock. 1-800-222-KBC is the telephone number. For some reason, some people who had called just a moment ago hung up. No, you don't do that. Once you get on the line, sooner or later we'll get you. Lou will get you. He'll answer your call. And uh, once you get on the line, we will get to you. So don't hang up. 
even if it rings 20 times or so before Lou gets to you, he will get to you. Just let it ring, because you will uh, you will eventually get on. So 1-800-222-KABC is the telephone number. Toll free wherever you are in Southern California. Uh, let's see now. Um, do we have time to take another call right now? I guess we can start another call right now, and then we'll come back uh, and finish it afterwards. Uh, Raleigh, you're on the air. Hi, Ira. How you doing? Good. You know, before I talk about what I called about, I wanted to ask you, have you heard about what the Cubs are going to do over in uh, the outfield with regard to the apartments? Well, I've heard that they're going to try to build up, uh, well, they're talking about it anyway, build up the, the height of the stand so that the, those people won't get an easy view. Right. Might interfere, you know, might interfere with some of their view. I don't know whether that'll actually happen or not. I mean, but, but don't you think that's really crazy? Why is it crazy? Well, for years and years, they've had a tradition of sitting on, you know, the... I know, but now it's become a commercial thing, you see. And when it was just people sitting up there for, you know, who lived in the apartment, but now people are selling seats up there. Oh, they are? Oh, yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. That's, that's the reason, because it's become a commercial venture for some of those people. Oh, I thought it was just the people who lived in the apartment. That's what it that used to be. That's what it used to be, but not anymore. Oh, I see. Okay? Yeah. All right, that's that's the reason why they're thinking about it. Oh, well, okay. And then also, I mean, you haven't heard about them um, uh, commercial, I'm putting up ads in the, you know, behind the, the backstop at, on the brick. Uh, I don't think Ruby Field will ever do that. Oh, that would be great, yeah, because... They've never had advertising signs at Wrigley Field ever since the places uh, that I know of, ever since 1940, whatever. There's never been ads on the, on, uh, anywhere in, in uh, Wrigley Field. Right, because that would just be a travesty, you know? I don't think they would do that. That's good. And after all, the Tribune Company really doesn't need the money. <laughs> yeah, you're right about that. Okay? You're right. Well, Ira, uh, you were talking about the Kennedy assassination. All right, hold on. We'll come back to the Kennedy assassination after the, news, after the uh, weather report. Yes, I'm sorry, sorry, traffic report. Oh, Hang on. Do. Traffic report coming up right now. And here is Rob Marinko. Rob, I'm sorry I screwed that up, but no uh, tell us about the traffic. I, I'll do that, Ira. It's a, it's a lovely evening. There's some weather for you, too. A problem in El Monte, San Bernardino Freeway, eastbound before Santa Anita Avenue. An accident involving a couple of vehicles. So most of that activity blocking the right lane. Willowbrook, Century Freeway, eastbound of Wilmington. You're going to find an injury incident there. Three vehicles slammed together. That mess is blocking the number three lane. Remember, that's the uh, lane, the third from the center divider, as, as you travel out from the center divider. Torrance, San Diego Freeway southbound at uh, Normandy. Injury wrecked there. One vehicle involved. It's off to the right shoulder. The I-10 eastbound at the Crosstown Freeway, the 30. Disabled vehicle blacked out in the right lane. Very dangerous situation. Sherman Oaks, 405 northbound before Burbank Boulevard. You're going to find an injury incident there involving several vehicles blocking the left two lanes. On the KABC Traffic Watch, I'm Rob Marinko, Talk Radio 790 KABC. If you're interested in a career in a field involving computer electronics or information technology, KABC. 20 minutes after 11 o'clock, I'm Ira Fistel. We're going to midnight tonight, uh, filling in for Doug McIntyre, who was on the air earlier today. 1-800-222-KABC is the telephone number, toll free. We do have a couple of lines right now. And Raleigh wants to talk about the JFK assassination quickly. Uh, Raleigh, what about JFK? Well, the other night you were saying how this is uh, a question that will never go away, and it's always going to be coming back over and That's over. That's right. Right? That's right. Well, don't you feel that it's the government's fault that this thing would... I mean, they're adding to this, this problem by ho putting that 2029 date on the evidence before they'll release it? No. That was by agreement with the Kennedy family. That That's to protect the members of the Kennedy family. Protect them from what? From publicity, from prying, prying reporters and all. There's nothing there to discover. There's nothing left to discover. Anything, anything that ever was to discover has been discovered long ago. I don't think you'll ever find anything that hasn't been already enlightened. There's you, nothing you else to know. You mean the Kennedy family agreed to that? They asked for it. That's, that's how it was done, because the Kennedy family wanted it that way. I hadn't realized that. Oh, yeah, they definitely, you know, they wanted the protection from the, uh, you know, prying eyes of uh, reporters and whatever. Well, and, you know, by that time, everybody who was alive uh, in 63 will presumably be gone, and it won't make any difference. So, I think uh, that's, that's all that's about. Okay, but th there's still uh, other problems. I mean, the, 
I could agree with you had not it been for the the number of strange deaths that have occurred, uh, you know, with all of the witnesses that were connected to it. No, there wasn't anything to witness, so uh, I, I don't think there's anything to that except perhaps con maybe a certain degree of uh, coincidence. But again, you know, you're talking about it, something that happened close to 40 years ago. Right, but I, I'm There's still an awful lot of people the... alive who were there. What? There are an awful lot of people alive who were there who didn't die. Think of all the people who didn't die. That's true, but the number of the people who did die, uh, I mean, it's in the hundreds, you know, so... Oh, I don't think it's anywhere near that high. I mean, if it is, it's because of normal reasons, just uh, time. Well, no, they were accidents. They, I mean, it's just too implausible that that many people could have died. That it's too implausible that anybody could have had that kind of a secret and kept it secret for that long. Oh, oh I That's I just not possible. That. Just not possible. Uh, no, I don't think there's anything to the to the conspiracy stories. I just don't believe it. Uh, well, if, if after the, if all this time nobody has got any proof, I don't think they're ever going to have any proof. Well, what about the magic bullet? I mean, that. Well, it's it. it's not easy, but it can it can have happened. It's not easy to accept, but it, yes, it can have happened. It can have happened. You yeah. actually believe that? Oh I yeah, know. yeah. I don't think there's any alternative. Okay. Well, it's pretty far from all right Raleigh I know I haven't convinced you all right thank you Bye -bye. okay thank you Ira and now it's 23 minutes past 11 o'clock Hilda hello there hello yes you're on the air oh hi Ira hi what can I, I do for you? you I'd call back tonight this is Sarah <laughs> <laughs> now really um I have to make a terrible confession I realized at last that I have mis been, been misjudging the president. Oh, oh, I just got the most interesting release. This will hearten you too, I'm sure. It's from Washington D.C. and it says, "Vowing to restore the pristine splendor of America's natural treasures, President Bush Monday unveiled Project National Parks Cleanup, an ambitious program to remove all toxic petrochemicals deposited under the ground in the national parks." Uh huh. It says here that in there are fossil poisons, we're quoting him, fossil poisons beneath an alarming 38% of our national parks. Though a majority of these poisons are buried under several million tons of rock strata, should they ever seep to the surface and spread into the surrounding areas, they would spell disaster for the park's precious ecosystems. And then there's a quote from, um, what's her name? Um, Christy uh, Whitman? Who? Christy Whitman? No, Gail Norton. Oh, Gail Norton, yeah. Who says, as governor of Texas, Bush fought tirelessly to protect the state's subterranean environment through a series of massive petrochemical deposit cleanup projects. Under his governorship, more tons of petroleum-based subterranean environmental contaminants were removed in Texas than in all the national Superfund cleanup sites combined. Now, I don't, what are you reading from here? <laughs> oh, yeah. What are you reading? I am reading a press release. A press release. A press release. In I, uh, come on, this is... Uh, you know what You're it's supposed to be howling at I know what I'm what I think I'm hearing. What I think I'm hearing is uh, somebody who is taking off on uh, oil drilling. <laughs> of course. Yeah. But only it is so serious. Well, it's just the way it's put. <laughs> uh, did this come off the internet or something? Yes. Uh huh. Of That's why I did. Listen, I have to tell you, you have the nicest <laughs> screener. He helped me find something on the internet while I was waiting. Oh, okay. I hope you thanked him. That's Lewis. <laughs> okay. I'll I go. thought I knew what you were talking about there. Well, but... I just thought it was so delicious. <laughs> <laughs> I said, this is for Ira. A little on the subtle side. <laughs> <laughs> Not very. <laughs> Not... <laughs> Not when you're going to clean up all the subterranean petroleum <laughs> and Yellowstone. <laughs> All right. Okay, all right. Thank you very much. Have a good week. Uh, you see, satire is not dead. It didn't close Saturday night. Here it is Monday, and it's still satire. 
Thank you very much, Silva. It's 26 minutes after 11 o'clock on Talk Radio 790 KBC. That is satire. Attack by indirection. 1-800-222-KBC. The number, Mike and Eagle Rock. You're on the air on KBC. Yeah, hi. Uh, did you hear on the news? I heard this one time only, and I haven't heard it since then. They said that uh, there are 20, uh, I think they said registered sex offenders that live in that same building that Chandra Levy lived in. Did you hear that? No, I can't say I did. Well, I, I know that I heard it, but I, I heard only heard something, it something, but I'm not sure that that's what it was that I heard. Um, well, I know I heard that's what they said, but uh -huh. they only said it once. You know, doesn't that seem bizarre to you? Well, I don't know. I mean... I don't know how big the complex is, the building is. I mean, the 20 sex offenders could be living in that one building. It, it makes you wonder how many millions of sex offenders there are <laughs> in this country. That's another good point. And, and, and also the fact they're just... All this, you know, the media has focused all this attention on Gary Conner. Yeah. Maybe they should go after some of these other people. Well, I'm sure the police, if, if there's anything to that, the police must have been investigating that right from the beginning because yeah. that's the most likely way you'd look. Anyway, what I called about, uh, does it bother you that the Pope is... Let me first off say that I am not a Catholic hater. I am a non-practicing Catholic. I went to Catholic schools all my life. Okay. I just want to get that straight to begin with. And, you know, I don't think the Pope is out to take over the world or any of that crazy nut stuff. But I don't like the Pope, what he's doing. If So far he's in, come over here and advised Bush twice or, you know, politicians here in this country twice that I know of. First he got that guy in one of those Midwest states to commute the death sentence of somebody back there. And, and the governor went along with that of a convicted murderer. And now he was advising Bush to, uh, you know, not to go ahead with the stem cell. Stem cell, cells. yeah. And I just don't like the way this pope is interfering with, the, with uh, you know, politics in this country. Well, Does that bother you? No, because he's not, uh, it's not a political thing for the pope. It is a religious, moral statement. He has the right to say what he believes to any, any national leader. And, of course, the president has the right to ignore it. Yeah. Well, I just think that, 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 that as far as I'm concerned, this pope is, is a doddering old man, and, and the, he, nobody should pay attention to what he says. I mean, he shouldn't be trying to, you know, force his, his version of religion on uh, over on this oh, boy. One of the reasons why he does have influence is because he is a, an old man who has worked very hard all his life for... You know, for yeah. uh, well, I just I just think he exaggerates his own importance, and they ju yeah. I just don't think they should pay attention to him. You know, and yeah. that comes from a non practical yeah. Catholic. I, I went know. to you, you know church through my high school and everything. You know, it just it irks me that this guy, this old man, is you know comes over here and tries to influence things. One other thing, have you heard uh, Giselle McKenzie's radio spots in the morning on KBC? Uh, no, I haven't. She's doing, yeah, she's doing, like, some public service announcements, I think, for the California Department of Asians. Aging. Oh, they run great. Like, they've great. been, like, around 10.30, 1, 1.30. Oh, no, I'm in school. I don't hear it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's nice to hear her. Yeah. She's a beautiful woman. I oh, think yeah. She's the best singer I, I ever heard. I remember her, um, your hit parade shows very, yeah. very well. Yeah. Maybe you get around to interviewing her one I'd love days. to one of these days, yeah. Okay. Okay. All hey, right. Thank you, Mike. Talk to you. Bye-bye. All right, KBC time is 11.30. Uh, Stuart, you're on the air on Talk Radio 790 KBC. Uh, yesterday you were talking about um, term limits. Yeah, and how I uh, my, my grand plan for claiming the term limits are unconstitutional. Well, that's why I'm calling, but before you, you before we get to that, I just want to say that I agree with all of the points you made, but also the bigger point, I think, is that it's just so anti-democratic. Yeah, it is, exactly, but that is one of the points I made. Uh, we're, what term limits says is we know what's better for you than you do. You shouldn't be allowed to vote for this guy more than twice, because we say you shouldn't. Exactly. What I didn't follow, though, is the argument that you were making. Okay. Uh, my argument is based on the Fourth Amendment, I believe, of the Constitution of the United States. I right. think it was... I think it was the... Was it the Fourth? No, the Clause Fourth, not the Amendment. Clause, fourth, uh, fourth Article. Uh, the Fourth Article, uh, titled The States and the Federal Government, says, quote, The United States shall guarantee to every state in this union a Republican form of government. doesn't define what that means and uh, protect them against invasion, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All well, right. What is a Republican form of government? The argument would be that a Republican form of government is one in which the voters of the state have the right to elect their own legislators. Then the next step would be to say that uh, denial of the right to elect the same person more than twice or three times amounts to a denial of Republican government because it says to the voters, you can't vote for who you want to vote for. I see. See, so my argument would be based on the 
Republican form of government clause, which has never been defined by the courts. We don't know what a Republican form of government means. Well, I had always thought a Republican form of government was um, uh, to be contrasted with a democracy. A pure democracy is where anyone can vote. I mean, anything is up for a vote. Whereas a Republican form mm -hmm. of government is that there are certain sort of inalienable rights that aren't subject to a vote, like the things uh, enumerated in the Constitution. Oh, no, I don't think that's the distinction at all. The, the distinction between Republican and democracy according to, well, there are a couple of definitions about this. Uh, one of the definitions is that a republic is any government that doesn't have a hereditary monarch. Well, that's obviously not applicable in this case. The other definition is the one that James Madison uses in Federalist Number 10, where he writes that a republic is what we today call a representative democracy. A republic is a government in which you vote for people to do your public business rather than vote on every issue directly, as the Greeks did. I think. That's what a republic is under Madison's form of government. Now, since Madison 